we are super excited today to have with us as our guest, a guy named Ian Cairns. Some of you may better may know him better as Kanga. Uh, he is a world champion surfer. Um, he's also an amazing historian, and uh, he's also a good friend of mine. So just wanted to take a opportunity to have a good conversation with him today. Hope you enjoy it. Ian, thanks for coming on. Welcome oh. to the show. Well, thank you, mate. It's, uh, I'm, I'm really stoked. The, the times that we've had at the SUPVET retreat, yep. um, yeah, meeting you guys and sort of uh, uh, my uh, parents were in the Army in the Second World War. Yeah. My dad was a lieutenant and he was an engineer up in New Guinea. Yeah. And my mum was a nurse in northern, northern Australia. So, you know, they were, you know, they got together, you know, through that. So right. there's been a really big history of, in Australia of Australians going off to war, you know, World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam. And all, it's always been in sort of collaboration with America. And so the close uh, relationship is allies. And uh, our, you know, the, the background of, of the Anzacs, which is the Australian New Zealand Army Corps, right. um, in, in going to war in support of freedom and, you know, the rights and democracy and all those same sorts of things. Uh, you know, I really relate to you guys. And, uh, you know, uh, I love military history. Right. So the, the uh, uh, an anecdote, you know, the first black guy I ever saw was in Sydney when I was like 11, when the Enterprise came into Sydney Harbour. And there was this <laughs> Navy guy walking around. And I was like, wow. Now we have, so it was, you know, I mean, you just imagine how white Australia was back then. Yeah, when, yeah, you, know, yeah. you know, we had Aboriginals. But it was sort of like that whole introduction to uh, the military and the size and organisation of the military um, has always been really interesting. You know, I, had, I had the privilege that we had talked about it. You know, when I, um, in my, in my last platoon in the SEAL teams, uh, we had the deployment down our first, uh, our first exercises with the SAS down there in, uh, in Perth. Yes. And we were able, and that was during Anzac uh, uh, celebrations as well. Yeah. So um, one of the, you know, what really impacted me from when I, when I worked with them and, and celebrated Anzac Day with y'all was the fact that they brought everybody home. Everybody came back to the regiment. And we had the dining in, and the officers. We would sit in one spot, and sta maintain stationary. But every fifteen minutes, the enlisted you know, guys rotated through. So you got to meet darn near everybody in the regiment mm -hmm. over the course of that three-hour, you know, uh, dining in celebration. And then, uh, then having you know the the rum and coffee mixture at five o'clock in the morning, watching the sunrise come up. Um, it was just a really powerful ceremony, like you said. It really cemented in in my in my brain anyway. Uh, the closeness between Australia and uh, and the U.S. and how you know what we've done together, um, military military wise. Uh, so, all that said, kind of give you know just for the audience, um, you know, uh, give them a little sense of once your parents kind of you know, came together, and what was life like growing up for you growing up? Um, what were some of the you know impacts you had from either? Your parents or society itself. Now you started on the east coast of Australia at first, then you went over to the Western Australia. Yeah. Kind of give us some sense of how it was back in those days, uh, to kind of give uh, the audience a sense of what makes you you. Well, I I was born in Melbourne. Yeah. And Sydney and Melbourne have always been very very competitive cities. Yeah. Um, Sydney uh, was the site of the first fleet when the convicts first came to Australia. Yeah. And Melbourne, so therefore, it always had the history of the. Uh, colonials and the use of the convicts as labour, whereas Melbourne w it was settlers with no convicts. So there's, there was always this competitiveness. That's why Canberra is actually positioned, the capital of Australia is positioned <laughs> in smack in the middle between Sydney and Melbourne because no one decides what the capital city <laughs> should be. And so... You know, I learned something today. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you grew up in Melbourne and, and Victorians have a way about them. And then, so we moved to Sydney and Sydney's a little bit looser and more, um, you know, it's uh, probably more international because of the big harbour and everything. Yeah. And uh, so, I, you know, we moved to the beaches in, um, in, at Avalon, which is on the north side of Sydney. Yeah. And, you know, beautiful beaches with all these bays. <clears throat> and uh, so everyone, you know, goes to the beach in summer. Yeah. You know, we would have picnics at the beach at nine o'clock at night in 
you know, because no one had air conditioning. Yeah. It was just hot as hell. And so Australia is, um, you know, very, very beach oriented. So my dad taught me, you know, I learned how to swim and I learned how to you know, bodyboard and I borrowed boards, surfboards out of the Surf Life Saving Club, which is an institutional uh, situation for life saving volunteers. And they have recreational clubs there and they do all sorts of crazy stuff. And that's really historically surf life saving as part of Australia. But uh, there's rules. <laughs> Right, and it was just, and I'm so I would borrow boards out of the surf club. My older brother, um, he was a prefect at, at um, the high school, yeah. and I. When well, how I old went are you to, right now? What you, what's your age? Uh, I was I was about ten or eleven. I started yeah. I started surfing was a you know body surfing and stuff when I was about ten. Okay, yeah, you know, it's Australia. The flags are there. The little shark alarm would go off, and everyone <laughs> screaming leaves the water and stuff. You know that. Um, that whole thing about Sydney was was like that, and my dad was was an engineer, but my grandfather on uh, my dad's side was a wharfie, you know worked on the wharves, total blue collar, trained greyhounds we, you know my grandmother would have to grab his pay packet off him on Friday night before he you know, pissed it away at the <laughs> pub or gambled it away on the horses and you know, but my dad went to um, he had a scholarship to private high school, Wesley College, okay. which would be like a prep school in yeah, America. Yeah, yeah. And then he got a scholarship to Melbourne University and became an engineer. So the first guy in that whole Cairns family that had a, you know, a you know, college degree. And in some way, that disenfranchised us from the rest of the family. Like I, I didn't, you know, these brothers were jealous or something. I mean, it was just terrible. So we, ne we never saw, for literally for 30 years, um, his brothers and my cousins and so, you know, dad was uh, in building and you know, he got a job in Western Australia. Yeah. Like Western Australia is the, I mean, seriously, it's the far side of the country. Right. And um, so he goes off and he's working up north with the first iron ore mines. You know, so yeah. digging in northern Western Australia, everything's red because of iron ore. You know, everything that's getting, all the steel getting made in China today, it's coming from Western Australia. Wow. Okay. So dad worked there and, you know, we got in the car and we drove our old Falcon. My brother and sister and I in the back seat and mum and dad in the front. And we drove the two and a half thousand miles across Australia to, across the Nullarbor. And back then, uh, when we drove in 1966, January, I mean, January, it's hot as hell. You know, it's the desert, driving across the desert. There's a gas station every 100 miles and nothing in between. There's tanks where you could fill up your water bottle. It was on like a <laughs> hessian bag on the front of the car. So you'd stop in at Ivy Tanks and fill up the water bottle and move on. And you had to stop in at each gas station and just say, hey, we're the Cairns family. I like we made it. <laughs> Otherwise, and there was 1,500 miles of dirt road. How long did that take you going across? Uh, it, it's about three days, but okay. it was... Um, 1,500 miles of dirt road it's the main yeah, was right. the main highway. So I drove across Australia seven times in the last time when it was actually paved. So it was, you know, Australia was, um, I, I, you know, when we, when we got to Perth, my, you know, we said, Dad, we need a place near the beach. So we ended up there and we rented this house five doors from the best surf spot in Perth. And so I had just got my surfboard. Um, Dad had gone away to Western Australia, and then Christmas happened in 1965, and Dad was adamant that I would not be a surfer, right? <laughs> I was borrowing boards, but my brother and sister, my aunt, all teamed up and bought me a surfboard. So I had my board, I had it on the roof, and, you know, away we went to Western Australia, and, you know, every day, morning and night, hours on the weekends, it was like eight hours in the water at a time, Endless, infinite amount of time out there surfing, paddling up and down, just you know because. Well, what attracted in, you to that? Well, so you know, kind of get into it a little bit. So what? Well, what, what in, would, in Sydney, in Sydney, I, 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 for some reason, I've been blessed and cursed with the why gene. Like, <laughs> why? When someone tells me to do something, I go why? Because I need to understand stuff. Yeah. You know, and right. I can go, oh, oh, I get that, or no, I disagree, and. Often I disagree, right? So the, uh, I was pretty much an outcast in um, growing up in school and high school. I'm the, I'm the kid in the office getting the cane. 
Uh, you know, my brother's a, you know, the prefect. Ask and, him why all the way. And I'm getting the cane and and Cant's kid. And um, but I, you know, went sailing first. And you know, because I really wanted to do something in the water, and I loved the idea of sailing. So I learned how to sail, and I sa sailed competitively before I started surfing, actually. And uh, so it was really, really interesting. You know, the uh, when the wind hits the sail, mm -hmm. the kind of energy that gets generated, yeah. and then you have motion, and it's really similar to surfing because you have this energy coming at you, and yeah. it picks you up, and away you go, like. Yeah. These, these motive forces that, that happen. So I'm out surf, borrowing boards from the surf club in South Avalon and out there surfing. And I, you know, didn't want to join the club because I didn't want to do, you know, the um, patrols and all this sort of stuff. And they wore these little funky hats. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I paddled up to the beach because I saw guys were surfing the far end of the beach. And on North Avalon, there was this sort of like rebel crew. And this, this was the surfers. Mm. And I went, whoa, like, these guys are cool. <laughs> this was, it was really the first time I ever felt connected yeah. to a community, you know, because there was no judgment. There was all these different people doing all this different stuff. And there didn't, didn't appear to be any rules. Of course, in the surf, there's always, you know, there are rules. Sure. But the, it was just sort of like, oh, you know, yeah, come on, go surfing. And it was, well, it was really liberating to find something. And so when I went to Western Australia, this is what I did. I had my, my board. I went surfing every, every waking moment that I wasn't at school. Um, not, a, not a good student. I mean, uh, who is actually separated from the rest of the class? I was isolated because I was so disruptive in class. Yeah. And, you know, so it just d didn't go well. And. The, uh, what, what, give, me a, give me an example of, of, a, of, a, of a Karen's moment in, in the classroom that would be disrupted. It was always you know, messing around, throwing stuff, uh, distracting the teachers, because it's, um, education in, in Australia at that time was, you know, you did what you're told, or you go to the office and get the cane. Yeah. Right, that's, and so yeah. I was on the way to the office fairly often, <clears throat> and it was, like, if you explain to me why I need to do this, I, I will conform. But just, don't just flat out tell me what to do. <laughs> and, and what was infuriating to everyone is I always passed. I always passed the classes. Yeah. And then, um, you know, before, you know, Australia had a system, I don't know if it's like it now, but when you were 15, you could choose to go and, and, go and um, do a trade. Yeah. So you'd become an apprentice and do something. Yeah. And at that point, uh, I won a Commonwealth scholarship to go to um, a trade school. And I was going to become a um, laboratory technician. But we did amazing things like photography and glass blowing and uh, photography, uh, uh, you know, where we, you know, make our own black and white prints and did all of this really crazy stuff. But we also had some pretty heavy academic stuff. Right? Yeah first year university um, math and, and, and uh, I was always really, really good at English. You know, I, I can talk and I can write. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, the whole math thing was, a, which was a mystery to me and my dad was an engineer. So <laughs> he just couldn't understand. A bit of irony there. <laughs> and, you know, so then, it, you know, they had it mapped out. Um, my pathway was going to be going to yeah, by this time, my, my brother had graduated as a geologist from okay. the University of Western Australia. My sister was a nurse yeah. who ended up running hospitals. Yeah. Um, you know, so you know, pretty high achieving people. And I want to be a surfer. <laughs> and well, you, for, the, for the audience, especially back then, there was no real professional route back then. No, was there? well, no, there, there was no route. Yeah. In fact, it was the exact opposite. Yeah. Whenever there was, um, you know. Uh, you know, an issue about the dole, which is you know, uh, unemployment money, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. that's the dole. Yeah. Um, the dole bludges are people that are just sucking the, you know, the lifeblood out of the com yep. country, right? Yep. It was always a picture of a surfer, which is probably pretty true. <laughs> <laughs> Why work we can get the dole and go surfing? Yeah, I mean, right? 
Yeah. So, was not the like. Uh, so it was, <laughs> but that was the image. And so, of course, my dad, uh, you know, was pretty conservative and they're just going, okay, you need to be doing this. And I'm going, well, no, I'm going to go surfing. And, you know, so fairly quickly I won a state championship at my local break and then... What age were you then? Uh, I was 15. 15. Four, I was actually okay. 14, I think. Okay. Yeah, I had got my first surfboard at 13. So by 15 I was winning state titles. So what, what, what did you do differently to get to that level at that age? What were some of the things that you had uh, that other kids didn't have? Um, I was actually... Uh, Australia has a very, very strong... Um, uh, surf club, right? That's what I mean. yeah. So, what's made you different? Because they, they had a good culture there, as far as the, the culture yeah. was all across the country. There were surf clubs. So, my local surf club, there were there was one in in you know, Cottesloe. You know, coincidentally, we um, landed in a pretty affluent town, like yeah. the wealthiest town. Yeah, I surf there. That's actually yeah, Cottesloe. Nice Cottesloe. Right? It's pretty nice. I yeah. mean, I dare you to afford a house today. Yep. But we were just renters in that area. Yeah. And so, the main beach of Cottesloe had the you know, the, the kids that came from Peppermint Grove and that, but my beach had working guys. And so Southern Surf Rider was the club. So I had these older guys that were mentoring. There you go. I was surfing okay. with those guys and they go, you know, Ian, let's, you know, we'll do this. They had a, uh, a shack down at Margaret River at Preble Park. Yeah. So, you know, we would go down and go surfing and somehow my parents let me go off with these older guys. And, <laughs> I mean, you imagine today, like right? your, your 13, 14 year old son's going to go off with these older guys. You'd be going, oh, wow, that's weird. But it was just sort of like a really great uh, steady guys that had regular jobs, mm -hmm. that worked hard, that surfed. And I, you know, got good, you know, miraculously. Yeah. Um, well, again, good mentorship, good, good examples, obviously. Yeah, right? and, and yeah, so, some high performance surfing and yeah. then competing with other clubs yeah. and that interaction with people. And, and so I, I grew up in, in Perth, in Cottesloe, where the waves are sm small mm -hmm. uh, because there's reefs and islands offshore, sort of. Right. So not much swell gets in there. But, yeah. you know, little did I know that, you know, three hour drive south, there yep. was Hawaii. Right. So Margaret River and Yelling Up are literally the closest yeah. facsimile to the North Shore of Oahu of anywhere in the world. Yeah. So when we went to Yelling Up and I started to, you know, win state titles there and go to Margaret River and, and all of a sudden I'm getting this sort of um, extremely high level training simply by the ocean dishing it out. Yeah. You know, if you have ever been to Sunset Beach or Pipeline or whatever, like you get schooled fast. Yeah, if you can just even paddle out, you've, uh, you've raised the bar of your performances uh, automatically at that uh, point. Crazy. Yeah. But I was... This is what I went down and I surfed and ultimately ended up moving down there. So when I first went to Hawaii, I rocked up at Sunset Beach and I went, oh, this is familiar. You know, this is like Margaret River. <laughs> oh. But it's just bigger and better. Yeah. And, and so, you know, growing up with those guys and doing that, um, Midget Farrelly was a world champion in, in 64. He came over, you know, to surf with us at a state championship. And then I became friends with him, and he mentored me and yeah. taught me how to shape. So I came back. I had a trade, right? I'm a surfboard shaper. There you go. Yep. So I ended up shaping about a thousand boards. Oh wow! So and, you know, back then it was all longboard too, right? Well, no, yeah, no. Right. In in 1968, I was on my oh no. 1968, I was on my first Western Australian team. I took my board before that was a nine foot six longboard. Okay. Yeah. And then it was an eight foot six V bottom. Oh, okay. All it was right. the shortboard revolution. Yeah, there you go. So you're right in the middle of the revolution. Right, right there. Yeah, so yeah, the okay. shortboard revolution occurred, and I went and I surfed it, um, you know, with guys like um, Wayne Lynch was, mm -hmm. you know, just like mega better than all of us in the, in the juniors. Yeah. But you know, I I won the most emerging surfer at that Australian title. It was, it was the Duke Kahanamoku Trophy was because Duke Hanamoku yeah. brought surfing to Australia in the 20s. That's right. In oh, Sydney. Yeah. Yeah. And so he's very, very venerated in, in Australian surfing world yeah. as the person that uh, you know, took the clubbies and taught him how to ride a surfboard. And so that to me was like, whoa, Duke Hanamoku, really? Which in, in a sense, I think it lit up the idea of going to Hawaii and maybe living up to that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so 
that was 1968 and I competed in 69. I came fourth in the Australian titles and I would always, they had multiple rounds. Mm -hmm. I would always bomb in one round and then I would go and do brilliantly in two rounds and I'd make the final and end up third or fourth. And so it was this, so competition to me seemed, <clears throat> you know, even though I, I knew I was a very good surfer, but competitively it, it just seemed like this amazing sort of enormous minefield of stuff that I couldn't understand. And it was you know, complex and how could I get beaten by people that I know that I get, you know, yeah, It's all about strategy. Than, you know, working all, all, of yeah. this, all of yeah. this sort of stuff yeah. was just crazy. And so I made the Australian team in 1970, and that's when I first met Americans. And I went, you know, these are kind of cool people. <laughs> you know, so it was, um, I was at the um, Midget Farrelly Surfboard Factory. Okay. And we're talking like perfectionist. Yeah. This guy was you know, world champion. He was a great surfer. Yeah. Everything he did was like, the, the boards were just perfect, you know, just gorgeous. The pin lines, the gloss coats, the glassing, the shaping. Yeah. Yeah. Like when you shaped there, you could not leave a scratch in the foam. You know, it had to be perfect. Yeah. And every piece of the whole process was perfect. He was a hard taskmaster. But anyone who worked there became a great you know, craftsman. Yep. And, you know, in the, in the, in the spirit of, surfboard making yeah. which is an, an amazing craft uh so i'm there and all of a sudden this combi pulls up and these guys jump out and they're um you know wearing their green jackets and all dressed up and everything and it was the south african team <laughs> and there's sean thompson and michael thompson <laughs> and you know i'm just you know been in the been in the sanding room or something i got shorts and my got with long hair and i'm just looked like a bum and here's these guys all dressed up in their suits but it was the first time the first interaction that i had with the south africans mm -hmm. and ultimately became really good friends with sean thompson but uh we uh so you know the contest is in melbourne but it's at bell's beach oh yeah 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 it's at bell's beach and um i got no ride i mean no i had no money no, what I didn't realize was we grew up poor. Yeah. Like, we didn't have anything. And so the, uh, this, this guy, Kiwi White, has organized me to ride in this um, car. It was an old Dodge um, with Corky Carroll and <laughs> uh, Drew Harrison, this guy from Kauai, um, and then Kiwi White. And I'm in there. And I get in the car and I didn't smoke dope or anything. And they're just lighting up the whole way. I got my head out the window and it's piss and rain the entire way. And someone, the windshield wipers don't work. So we're doing this. And I'm talking to these American guys and like, uh, you know, Drew Harrison just goes, like Australians, they got to grab the rail to pull through the, the white wall and never touch the rail again. <laughs> and the Corky Carroll has like got all these amazing stories. And of course I've been... You know, reading the surfer magazines and stuff, and Corky Carroll's winning the sure. Australian, the US championships, and yeah. doing, got big surfboard models, and he's driving a Porsche and doing all this shit. And I'm in the same freaking car with these fools, you know? Right. And I was like, like wow. So we, you know, we end up and uh, they're off to, to go where they stay. I had nowhere to stay. So they dumped me at Bell's Beach in the middle of like the typhoon. <laughs> and um, fortunately, I got a sleeping bag and a, and a plastic sheet that my, you know, my uncle had given me. So I rock up and I just lay the sheet down in some sort of dry corner in the, local, in the toilets and lay down and I'd spend the night in the toilets of Bells Beach inside of a you know, tornado. And that's, you know, that was my introduction to Bells Beach. And so I, I went, and we went to the hotel and then I met the Hawaiians. Yeah. And I, you know, the, these gorgeous Hawaiian women, you know, Relson, and, and it was like, whoa, these chicks are goddesses. <laughs> like, the, it's all of this. And you go there and you meet all of these people from all over the world. You made good friends with the um, Japanese guy, Doji Osaka, who ultimately ran the ASP for me in Japan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when you go and you're a part of an, of an Australian team and you go and you meet with these other foreign teams, yeah. there's... Um, you know, you just meet these people and it become, you make lifelong connections. Yeah. It's really just an extraordinary experience. So you know, I met Margot Oberg, who I became really great friends with. Um, I met, you know, all of these, all of these guys. And it was just sort of like, 
you have this very, very narrow view, like in Australia. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we come armed with a big, pretty big chip on our shoulder, mm -hmm. you know, because we're just, the, you know, the little guys down there in America is like, oh, yeah, you guys are the big deal. So, of course, we got to become larger than life. Yeah. And so the, then I made the uh, Australian team in 1972, and I flew to San Diego. And it was funny, I was, um, you know, my son is now working in San Diego, and he goes, oh, well, let's meet at, meet at Ocean Beach. And I'm thinking, Ocean Beach, you know, that's where we had this, the contest. So I rocked up the, at Ocean Beach, and I went, wow, this place is, as horrible and you know decrepit and scungy as it was back in 1972, <laughs> and, I, and I go, "This is 1972. Right? This is where I, you know and Michael Ho had his car parked, and he borrowed a screwdriver and he jimmied the lock, yeah. and this is like all of these yeah. like experiences started to flash back on me, and then I went, that was 50 years ago, yeah, 50 years of yeah. this life. You know right, what I'm right, saying? Right. And now I'm sharing it with, with uh, Malachi and, uh, and Alyssa, and it's sort of like, you guys can't even imagine the world I'm in right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, so look, look at, Looking back at that, so give, give a, 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 an example of if you won a prize, what was like a typical prize winning at that point? You won a trophy. There was no it's money. That's right. No money, right? And uh, so what was... Uh, how, how, did the, how did the, like, uh, any of like Quirky Carol, any of those guys, how did they make... Well, Corky, at it. Corky Carroll um, had a model, a surfboard model yeah. with Hobie, and they sold, you know, they would do trips up and down the East Coast selling boards. Got it. Wayne Lynch had a model when he was 16 yeah. and flew across and went up and down the East Coast, made a ton of money selling surfboards. There you go. Yeah, yeah. So, so it was a surfboard model. There you go. And the surfboard industry was, was booming. You know, Hobie was huge. Yep. I mean, Los Angeles was the center of it. Yeah. Um, but the East Coast, you know, you know, they discovered surfing and yeah. you know some great surfers from over here back in those days, and um, so it was just really, really interesting, sort of like the this explosive growth. But uh, 1972, I went on to Hawaii from um, from San Diego, and you know, I'm staying in a house at at um, Backyards, which is up from Sunset Beach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was uh, uh, Paul Nielsen, Ricky Nielsen, me, and Grant Oliver Dapper. And, you know, Dapper was a, a, a smoke. He'd get up in the morning, put the, you'd hear the kettle go off, like, ee! then you'd hear, Shh, like his first smoke. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's Dapper. Like, yeah. unfortunately, he's died now, but. You know, I was staying in, you know, in this room with Ricky and Paul, and, you know, I was just completely unknown. But by surfing in Hawaii, which you know, I'm just going, oh, man, this is like being in Western Australia. Yeah. And so I surfed really well. But um, Paul and Dapper got into the Smirnoff, which was the, like, considered the world championship. So in 1972, yeah. it had already been running in 1971 and 1972. 1970, but uh, they got in that, and the day before they ran it at Haleiwa, we're down there, and I'm surfing e easily as well as, or better than anyone, but I can't get in because there's only 36 guys allowed in, and I had, there's no path, there's no pathway in, Yeah. and so those guys got in because they had better national championship results, and Paul Nielsen wins it, and Dapper comes third, yeah. and I'm just watching this thing going, wow. Like Paul's world champion, and I know I surf better than him. Yeah, and I couldn't get in. So here's here's a you know I get the you know I got different uh, topics we kind of go over on on these interviews, and one of them is the Eureka moment. I think this is, at, at this point, do you do you have that that moment where it comes into into kind of uh, clarity or vision of of a of a future way to do surfing competition to get paid for and things like that? It 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 is, but to me, it was. Profoundly unfair. Yeah, right. Like how, how could you be as good and not have a chance to even participate? Yeah. So then I, I, I went back to Western Australia and I was married at that time. And, uh, you know, we were, I, I went, all right, well, I didn't get in. I'm not going to uh, 
have a career in that because there is no career. You know right, what I'm saying? Right, yeah. There's no map. No, no. Mm. And I'm thinking, oh well, you know, I'll just get work for my parents and you know have raise a family. Blah blah blah. And my, my wife Pat at the time just went, you know, coming up to August and September, she said, "Dude, I can't, I can't live with you. <laughs> like you, <laughs> you have to go to Hawaii and get it out of your system." Yeah. So I go, all right, right, right. So I went a fly there, and, and it was expensive. Yeah. Like my first ticket to San Diego was two thousand dollars. Back then. In 1972. Yeah. That's, right. That's real cash. That's big money. Yeah. And so. You know, I fly back there. I got a hundred and fifty bucks to stay the the winter. You know, because cost of living was pretty cheap. We just yeah. rented rooms and stuff. And um, so now the Smirnoff is coming up again. And you know, I'm just going. Well, I'm not in. But I find you know, I'm I'm second on the alternate list. And the and a, the is, is there a price the, money on on this suit? five thousand bucks for Ooh, first. There you go. Okay, five thousand bucks. I got a hundred and fifty bucks. I'm second alternate. And it's at Laniakea, and it's like eight to 10, 12 feet, just perfect, way outside, all the way across. Just like, I'm just going, oh my God, check the waves. And, you know, the, I'm standing there, I got, a, got my hundred bucks, right? Yeah. And they go, Cans, you're in. You know, two guys didn't show. I yeah. think it was Evo Hansa from Peru didn't show up or something. So I'm in the contest, I hand over my hundred bucks. Yeah, and a hundred bucks in, 1972, you know, that was 70, yeah, 73, it's a lot of money. Yeah. I handed it over, put my jersey on, I paddle out, I get through the first heat, I'm going, oh, that's kind of cool. And then I, you know, somehow I'm in the final of the Smirnoff, like, I'm making money. Like, I'm going to make hundreds of dollars. Yeah. And, you know, so I'm just way outside, and Jeff Hackman was like the hero, I'd seen him in the magazines. He and I were out the back, and there were you know, Larry Bertelman and Mike Purpose and all these guys were on the inside doing all this tricky stuff. But we're way, way outside catching the bombs. And the set comes, and I'm just going, I'm in the, in the final with Jeff Hackman. I'm, Jack, <laughs> look at this wave, go! And he catches this wave, and I paddle over, and there's a bigger and better one behind. And I take off, and I just do my surfing. And you know, he, he said that he stopped and looked over the back and just... Hung his head, you know, <laughs> because I just rode this thing and I win the Smirnoff. I win the Smirnoff and I'm world champion. I'm getting called by ABC Sports in Australia to come to Sportsman yeah. of the Year. Yeah. I'm, this is, you know, I've got 5,000 bucks from 100. Yeah. That's like, you, and that was, that was an absolute total revelation. It was justification for the hard work. Yeah. Because you just don't know what are the limits. Where, where, you know, where can you go if you try? Yeah. And that's the, and, and I just went, and I, I learned something really, really important from a competitive standpoint. I just went, this is not complicated. You go out the back. You catch the biggest wave. You surf it all, you know, really good to the end. Then you go and do it again, and you win. <laughs> and suddenly the there's a eureka the, moment right there <laughs> the veil lifted and i realized yeah. wow yeah it really is that simple and so i went on and i won six world world championship level events by in and it was always in sort of big powerful right hand reef breaks which big powerful reef breaks was what i was schooled on <laughs> right, i was gonna say yeah yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean that was in, in big, powerful brain hand reef, reef breaks, I would consider myself exceptional. Yeah. And you know, easily at the level of, you know, Sean Thompson and Mark Richards and all of those guys. In anything else, I would think that, you know, me as a coach, I'd be looking back and going, dude, you need some work. You know, small waves, um, attitude, like if it's bad, you know, bad attitude. All of these things that I ultimately learned, learned in an analysis of my own strengths and weaknesses, I was able to teach other people to overcome yeah. those things. Like so when did you make that transition? So as far as like a, um, going and having that self-analytical ability 
and, and the, the coaching and, and, and the idea of being able because one thing I really liked about you when we worked down there with the SUP vets is you teach people who've never even been in the water how to handle some fairly gnarly surf down there at Burroughs in, in, in Mexico. So, um, and, and you make it simple. That's what I liked about it. it when, you, when you teach it to everybody, it makes it very uncomplicated. And like you just described, you go out the back, get the biggest one, do the most moves, go out and do it again. And, and the way you describe it to us is amazing. So kind of what led you to that moment? How'd you, how did you, at what point did it crystallize in your head? And then- Well, I, I think I had a natural ability to um, analyze um, my s surrounding. Like you, you have wide vision and yep. you understand everything out, all of the components. And what's so interesting about surfing is the um, infinite complexity of the ocean. Yeah. That it's always changing. However, everywhere you go, there's always a pattern. And I had a natural ability to sort of analyze a pattern. So when I won events, it was always in, by, by being in a different place in the lineup, riding a different wave to everyone else, that they uh, were surfing in a conventional manner. And I was always the odd man out doing something different. And when you do something different in a subjective sport and it, and it works, the judges can begin to go, well, why are they not doing that? Yeah. So now everyone's being compared to you, which, which is a good thing. And when you're doing, when you're doing stuff in, in big waves. So that, that ability, I didn't realize uh, because I, I started coaching, um, actually, I coached Sean Thompson in 1981 and almost won. It was my last year on tour. Yeah. I'd just won the, the World Cup at Haleiwa. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd won the World Cup at Haleiwa in 1980. Um, but what people didn't understand is I was at Haleiwa every day with uh, you know, two guys that wanted to surf with me, um, uh, Willie Morris and... We met there every day for a month at Haleiwa, and it, our rule was we went out, and if a wave had not yet broken, we had to go. And we went out on days when it was flat, and went on days when it was completely closed out and just psycho, you know, because that was the rule. So we went out there in every condition known to man, and, you know, days we just got completely massacred. But when it came to the contest, that day it turned up, it was actually about 12 or 15 feet. And, you know, off my corner, there were waves, you know, I'd, I'd be riding, you know, boom, 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 before I would get to where the other guys were sitting. And then I'd ride end, and the rip rush is out, so you don't really have to paddle far. So to stay where they are, you have to paddle constantly. And so I'd be coming out from a wave, and, you know, guys like Sean Thompson and Mark Richards would be looking they'd be tentatively going towards where I was, but I would just paddle mm. past them and they'd see a set coming and they would scramble back to their spot. And I'd be alone yeah. on another bomb. And it was just sort of like, it was so easy to win, but it's, I, I learnt that mm. you've got to have an uncon unconventional way of looking at things. You've got you've to do your work. Yeah. I remember talking with uh, Sean Pointer, who, you know, 2019 uh, SUP uh, world champion surfer. And because, you know, Ian, just so you know, Ian coached uh, Sean um, and he and I were talking about how you coached him. And it was like, yeah, we and it really reminded me of a military operation. And because you guys would get there, you know, say a week early, you would you would you would watch the breaks, you know, morning and night. And you would and you'd see where the uh, where the breaks were and then what type of break it was. And then you could plan the type of maneuver that would best, you know, so highlight, you highlight your surfing capability on that, on the, in any given condition. Yeah, it's choreography. Yeah. And it's just, it was so like, oh my, yeah, you're just, you're just planning it out. And yeah. I don't think a lot of people do that, do they? No, no, they, yeah. that would, yeah, you know, people would rock up on the day and just go, and I'm just thinking, how can you possibly know what's going on? Yeah. Given the complexity of the, you know, our workplace, yeah. the ocean is. Like, and, and given the size, I mean, if you looked at Huntington Beach, it's 200 yards from the pier to um, down to the, you know, the far south bank. Yeah. 
And there's maybe four or five different peaks in that thing. Depending on swirl direction, could be you know, a couple of south swirls and one west swirl. And so every one of those swirls will impact each of those sandbars in a different way. Yeah. And that's, so it's not random. So there's actually bathymetry, which I would, I would then go, well, why is it like this? So then I started to draw it up. And I go, well, here's the sandbar and here's the channel. And here's the way that wave would flow. And so you're going to ride this west swirl set and you're going to ride this way. But it goes into a deep channel, but the energy would swing in the channel and come back this way. Yeah. So if you wanted to make the connection, you had to use, you couldn't do a blow tail hack on the last move yeah. because you would lose speed. You had to do a carving move to use the energy flowing backwards. So therefore you're coming into the reform with speed <laughs> to be able to do a big ending maneuver. And this is just, so you're on peak two, this is how you have to surf it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, so you're going, so, you know, I coached Brett Simpson went to win two um, US Opens. And, you know, at the same time, I was coaching Courtney Conlog, who won the US Open. So both of them win. And at six o'clock in the morning at dawn, it was me, Brett and Courtney, and Mick Fanning, and Sally Fitzgibbons, the only people on the beach. And there's three of us there, and I'm looking around and going, why are you not here? Where is everyone? Yeah. Because every day it will be different. The swells will change. There'll be a, a pulse of the south set. There'll be, you know, all of this stuff will change. So you've got to come down and recalibrate your experience mm -hmm. for today. Yeah. And so once you've done that, oh, yeah, you go off and have breakfast and don't, you're good. You dial the, guys would rock up. You know, I had guys that I was coaching that were almost making the tour, did make the tour, and they'd rock up and go, oh, this, it, I brought the wrong board. This is not like yesterday. <laughs> like these boards in San Clemente, and I'm just thinking, really? Like, have you learned nothing? It's yeah. just, so you've got to do the work. Right. So. It, Thinking about that, um, you know, when I, was, when I was going through your book, uh, you know, talking about some of the dark days you had in Hawaii, because, you know, that's where you, you had your epiphany and all that. Um, as far as, let's think about, what, what do you think was like the low part that you, that you uh, hit in your career? And what did you do to get out of that, that, that low point? So I'm in Hawaii. Yeah. It's like, I'm in Hawaii. Yeah. Remember, I've won the Duke Trophy. Right. My dream is to be in the Duke contest. Yeah. Like, can I, can I be good enough to be in the Duke? How, how could I honor Duke's memory? Yeah. Could I get in the Duke contest? And I didn't make it in, the, in 73, um, you know, because I told everyone I wasn't coming, right? Yeah. So, uh, and it was voted by your peers. It was only 36 guys and all the surfers right. voted for who would be in. And, and so I, I didn't get in there, but I did win the Smirnoff, right? So the, in 72, when I first went there, I'm out surfing at Sunset Beach, Sunset Point at about, you know, four foot. Me and this, some guy paddles out, he's a little goofy foot guy. He starts to hassle me <laughs> in the water. And I'm going, we're well, the only guys out here. Like, why are you doing this? Yeah. Turns out it was Fast Eddie Rothman. Just being a punk, yeah. you know, because, um, you know, he'd seen me surf and knew that I was good, and he was just coming out to assert himself. And there was another guy there, you know, he and, he and um, Brian Surratt, they were partners in crime, literally. I mean, they were dealing drugs on right. the North Shore. Right. And so in the summer of 73, the... Uh, Brian Surratt had his legs broken because he screwed up in the drug dealing hierarchy and he tapped out and he went off and did it. But Fast Eddie stayed in that thing. So every time I came back and I got better, he was in parallel growing in uh, reputation as a heavy on the North Shore which is kind of bizarre considering he's a Philadelphia Jewish guy <laughs> that learned how, to be, learned how to be a thug at Huntington Beach. 
uh -huh. before he went to, you know, stealing cars and all sorts of shit in Huntington, before he went to the North Shore. Yeah. So he was already, you know, a criminal. And, you know, just, and I'm just going, you know, I'm not. And I think what you do is bullshit, right? Frankly, I don't want to be mates with you. I don't want to do your drugs. I just want to, I'm here to go surfing and to do the best I can. So the, each year we came back, you know, there was just more conflict because they realized, well, these, these guys can win. So now we have to protect the Hawaiian pride, right? And I'm just going, really? So the next year I came back and, you know, I, I did okay in the, in the Smirnoff 74. It was ginormous YMA. I mean, that's another story. Yeah. Uh, but I won the Duke. Um, no, 74, I came second in the Duke. And, you know, Rabbit was my caddy and we had no leashes. So when you, when you think about Sunset Beach, 15 or 18 feet, <laughs> no where leashes. you lose your board and you've got to <laughs> swim to the beach. Yep. And you've, you know, uh, one session at Sunset, I had 13 swims to the beach. Wow. I mean, that's four or 500 yards against massive rips. Yep. Get my board and paddle back out. So, you know, our level of fitness yeah. was uh, um, amazing. And then we had the... Uh, it was always crowded, and then we started to get hassled. So then it was the most horrible days known to man. We'd go, go out and see if we could make it. And me and PT paddled out at sunset one day when it was closing out. And you know, in between sets, there's like 10 or 12-foot waves um, just dumping in the, in, the rip, in the channel because of the rip, the water flowing. Yep. And so we get caught inside, and both of us lose our boards. And they're, you know, we're trying to chase them out in the rip because they're going to go to Kauai or somewhere. <laughs> and, you know, so we're swimming, and, and PT gets to his board, and he goes, Kangaroo, I, 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 and my board's there, and it's teetering, and the next set washes it over the falls at Kami Land, and I'm in the, in the rip at Sunset Beach, 15, 18 feet, closed out by myself, mm. swimming. And I'm going, just going, well, this is not good. Yeah. So my only way in, was to body surf one of these massive waves. So I swam into this thing and just, you know, got a massive wipe up and pounding. Because once you get into the white water, you get washed in, mm -hmm. right? This is, you don't dive deep, you go high and let it tumble you. Yep. And so I ended up at Rocky Point, like, you know, a mile down the beach, <laughs> got my board, walked back, and it just becomes one of those legends. You see those Aussies out there, they're crazy. <laughs> but in, in essence, what we were trying to do is see, what was the limit? Right. What was the limit? Yep. Yeah. Where could you go? And, you know, clearly I, I'm, I lived, so I didn't actually reach the limit. Right. And so that, that just opens up, pushes the boundaries back further and further. Yeah. And so now how far can we test this stuff? And so consequently, um, you know, we, we, you know, the, I talked about uh, Waimea. Mm -hmm. um, close out Waimea and in the um, 74 Smirnoff, I mean, it was, I mean, what, 30 feet, 50 feet? <laughs> so I wiped out on, the, on this wave and I'm swimming in. I get my board and I'm paddling out and I'm paddling around the break. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm caught inside by a close out set at Waimea. And, you know, I'm alone. There's no jet ski. Yep. There's no flotation. There's no nothing. <laughs> and I'm just going, I'd better hold on. Yeah. Because if you're wide like that, you can't swim into the beach because the waves are 30 foot dumping shore break going up a steeply shelving beach. You get dragged back into the shore break, boom. Yeah. You know, it's only a couple of those and you're done. Yeah. So I'm just going, I have to hold on because I don't have enough energy left to swim out and to the break and come in next to the point. Yeah. So this wave's coming at me like white water closed out. And I pushed under and I had my hands, I had my elbows on the board, I had my thighs gripping the board and I had my heels on the fin, single fin. And I'm just going all zen, right? Like <laughs> I am part of my board. <laughs> Push under and it's like... <laughs> and you know, you know that uh, you can do amazing things when you're going to die. <laughs> right. 
and time you know, boom, 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 and all of a sudden you're like about a thousand feet deep, and it's like a, an emergency, you know, takeoff by the submarine to yeah. come flying up and out of the water, holding onto the board, and I'm going, oh, yeah, I done that, <laughs> right? And it's just sort of, you know, paddled out, and I, I, I bombed, I, and but I, you know, took all those experiences. This was how could you become the ultimate waterman? Mm -hmm. It's by studying, and it's by learning, it's by analysis, and it's by, um, you know, taking meteorology and bathymetry and then, um, you know, testing your own endurance levels, yeah. your skills, you know, what can you, what can't you do? This, this was sort of like the fabric of what Kanga is. Right. You know, Kanga became an alter ego because that normal kid that just you know, got on the car and drove from Sydney to Perth was Ian Cairns, you know, under the influence of his parents and doing this stuff. But all of a sudden, Kanga's amongst the most crazy surf conditions. Uh, Ian is amongst these crazy surf yeah, conditions. Yeah, yeah. And I'm now dealing with um, gang warfare. Like, I'm targeted by the Hui, who are, you know, definitely pushing drugs and, you know, maybe killing people. And everyone's afraid, and you know I'm afraid of those guys too. But I realize that the thing that I'm more afraid of is the ocean. The ocean, to me, uh, is a thousand times more powerful than these hooey thugs. Well, you're never going to beat the ocean. If the no. Mother Ocean wants to beat you, she's going to beat you. It's it's. So I'm just going. All right. Well, I'm focused on. I'm. Regardless of what you guys do, I'm here to win, yeah. you know, because this is, and so then I had to develop this alter ego, which is Kanga. And, you know, I don't, you know, Kanga really, he would die to win. And I came close. Yeah. And so the, in, even though that was formative, like every man has to have those conflicts. Yeah. Um, the, my, my primary, Primary, um, the, the thing that sort of crafted Kanga was the ocean and how enormously powerful it is and how we don't win, we have to learn to flow and all, all of those things. But in the end, you know, I, I'm at it in the 75 Duke Hanamoku. Uh, we'd rocked up in the, you know, the early rounds were at Sunset Beach and now we're down to the you know quarters or semis or something. We you know the swell comes up like ginormous, and we're at uh, Waimea, and street signs are going like this. You feel the earth trembling as a wave breaks, <laughs> and the contest director goes, "If someone wants to go out, we'll run the contest." And I went, "I want to go out," and I did. Yeah. I genuinely wanted because I knew I'd already been in these sorts of crazy conditions. And I was ready. And everyone's freaking out at me. Like, you can't get this. It will all die. <laughs> and I, I, I said, I want to go out. Like, I won that contest in the parking lot. Yeah, because, yeah, you, you already. I was thinking, yeah, you already so I went it. out yeah. there. I charged. Yeah. I got through and made yeah. the finals. I'm riding these waves. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, why a mayor is just so incredible. It's, you know, up about 25, 20 feet. Like it's a really, really big wave yeah. and it's you know, challenging, whatever. Between 20, 20 and 25 feet, it becomes a completely different wave because the top of the wave jacks. So you like your pipeline on top of a 20-foot Waimea wave. It's jacking up and it's pitching and it was like so amazing. And so I'm out there just going for it and I caught this one wave in this final and I'm you know, powering into this thing. I stood up. And I rode an eight foot six board. You know, that was my big board. Everyone's on nine foot, 10 foot guns. Mm -hmm. So I was always late. Like I'd be taking off and there'd be a guy down the bottom down there. Yeah. Like, and I'm up here <laughs> dropping down. And so I take off in this wave and all of a sudden I'm going up backwards because this top part of the wave's lifting so much that I'm not going down anymore. And I realized, oh, I'm, I'm gonna have to bail. So I jump and I just ee, 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 down and hit the bottom <laughs> and waves like that, it's like concrete. Yeah. You can't penetrate. Right. And so I boom, all of a sudden I'm going over the falls and there's like 25, 30 foot wave. Mm -hmm. It turns out it closed out the bay. 
And now I'm just going, oh, well, this is going to be bad. <laughs> and it, like, boom, like this massive impact that you can't even imagine. I always said it was like being in a four-way intersection with four trucks colliding at the same time. Yeah. A massive impact. And, you know, somehow, because I didn't have a leash, I came up. And I came up with enough time to, you know, and I'm looking down this black tunnel. And off in the end is like light. And I can see people, mouths moving and arms going, but I couldn't hear a thing. And then the next wave hit me. But I'd come up quick enough to get a breath. And the next wave hit me and it tumbled me in. And I realized, like, I almost died. At that moment, if that had have gone black, I was dead. Yeah. And it was like, it was a, an epiphany. Like, I, our... You finally pushed the limit. I found the limit. <laughs> the, I realized the gamble is, in big waves, the wager is our life. So you put it on the line, and then you go out there and you do your thing. And there are a lot of people out there towing into big waves mm -hmm. that don't understand the wager. The wager. I mean, you, had a, you, you said a minute ago, um, every, every man, this is probably something that you know, modern sensibilities may not like, but every man needs tests. Right? Yes, you've got to have conflict. You have conflict. So um, kind of at this point, um, how did you feel about yourself as far as like Kanga versus Ian? Where, where do you, you talked about the different personas. What, what made Kanga, um, those tests, what did that, that did Kanga, you know, as you come back into, you know, this is kind of getting a little bit uh, into the mental aspect of it, obviously, but yeah, how, did, how did that, how did those two egos kind of well, combine at the end of the day? Ian is, you know, a careful and considerate person, yeah. you know, product of my background. Yep. And Kanga is in, the real world that's gnarly, realizing um, there's a warrior self. Like, yeah. did, you know, my first challenge is this, and like, brush these peons aside. <laughs> like, you think you're tough? Like, why don't you come out surfing with me? There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And let me show you. And it's, and it's really funny. The, um, I've had situations where people, um, you know, mm. when I'm competing, it, you know, it, it genuinely becomes okay. Well, I'm here, I'm here to win, so therefore I've got to bust him out. And no matter what, and I'll, I'll be fair. Like, it's how we're brought up in Australia. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, you, you're fair, but you cheat on me? Oh, so them's the rules now? <laughs> okay. I'm the guy that is willing to die to win. Like, are you? Yeah. Yeah, so I've had situ you know, situations with, in, in a contest with Buzzy Kerbox. He's a really good surfer and won a bunch of events. And I was watching him at Haleiwa. It was about 10 feet. It was mm -hmm. pretty big. And Mark Richards, you know, four times world champion, Buzzy kicked his board across in front of him to try and trap Mark's fins. And I'm thinking, dude, that's cheating. Yeah. Really? And so I just went, oh, well, you know, if I get in the heat with him, we'll see. So we get in the heat. <laughs> and he, I'm paddling to this wave, and he just shoots across inside of me and turns and jumps to his feet. And I just went, no. Nah. So I jumped to my feet, and, you know, we're meant to be going right. And so I just leant on him and got him in a headlock <laughs> and took him over the falls at like 10, 12 foot Haleiwa, like in a headlock and then cup, <laughs> and we're underwater, like maybe bouncing off the bottom, still in this headlock. <laughs> then finally I let him free and he comes up and goes like, you're crazy. And I go, yes, I am. <laughs> right? Yep. Give, give me my 10 foot perimeter mm. and stay out of my way. And sometimes that's how it has to be. You know, people will cheat on you. Then they need a spanking yeah. to understand that, you know, if we're all going to flow down this pathway of a, a nice organized world, you know, 
the, the cheetahs need spanking. And that's, so it just went on and on. So I got harassed endlessly. Um, so I come back in 1980. Yeah. For some reason, everything's hunky-dory on the North Shore. You know, Kanga's, you know, okay. And so I'm, I'm at a party at Sunset Beach. And um, well, what brought you back to after after all that? I didn't, you know, I, I actually worked on Big Wednesday as a stunt double oh, okay. yeah. in um, 1977. And, you know, so with Hollywood mm. and, you know, the actors and, you know, in um, 1976, I made 8,000 bucks in prize money. In 1977, I made 50 grand from Warner's, Warner Brothers. And I went. Hmm. hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do this. Maybe I, I would like to do more of this stuff. Maybe you're not very good at math, but you're good at that kind yeah, of math. Yeah, yeah. right? Arithmetic, I'm really good at. <laughs> and so I just went. But I, I kind of lost the, the real urge to, um, you know, compete because the economics of pro surfing, I mean, so we traveled the world and lived this great lifestyle. Yeah. You know, but we weren't buying a house. Um, we weren't saving up to have a family. We weren't doing any of this stuff. And um, so the, uh, I started, you know, we started the thing called the Bronze Dodgers and we're doing, you know, we, we literally had an international licensing company. We had surfboard licensees in Australia, in mm -hmm. America. We had our own store in America. We had Japanese licensees. Yep. You know, we were, we, our team, the Bronze Dodgers, we were hiring young guys to surf on our team and paying their expenses. We had a marketing business that was based on our successes as surfers, and we had a brand that we were promoting. Yeah. Sort of sounds a little familiar. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> so we were, we were doing that, and um, then I decided I'd like to come back and do some events. And at this time, um, a guy named Bernie Baker had started the Pro Class Trials. So you didn't have to have rankings. You could go on the Pro Class Trials and get into um, the Hawaiian events. So I went in there and I won the pro class trials and all of a sudden I'm in the World Cup again and I hadn't been competing and somehow I struggled and, and came um, and made it into the final with Buzzy Kerbox actually. <laughs> and I'm in the final at Sunset and I'd beaten Dane Kealoha and Reno Avalira mm. and you know, I meant to be gone and suddenly I'm beating these people and I get into this final and this is you know, kind of significant. I'm in the final yeah. and of course I'm not match ready, right? I'm, I'm tired, and I snap under this wave, it lands on me, and I fell, and I lost the final. I came second. It's, you know, coming second, you know, as Tiger Woods says, it's the first it's loser, loser, right? Yep. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not fun. Yeah. And I just went, ooh, wow. So that imprinted. You know, I'd come second in the Duke, in the Smirnoff, and the Bells, and a, a bunch of contests. So it's painful so th that happened and then I thought I would come back again in 1980 and I went through the pro class trials and I made it in again and then when I got to Haleiwa this is where I really trained and I did you know every day for a month mm -hmm. I'm training there and it was ginormous and but I'm getting ready for this and I'm I'm all kosher on the north shore no one wants to kill me and it's so I'm at a party and this chick starts talking to me and some guy bails. And next thing you know, they're screaming outside. Turns out it was Squiddy, who's Fast Eddie's partner. This was his estranged wife that I was talking to. Oh, no. And he's out, out the front with a gun. He's going to try and shoot me for his wife talking to me, even though they're broken up. And it's sort of like, oh, my God, you know, so it's on again, right? Yeah. And so anyhow, Hallie Eva is... Um, you cross the bridge and mm. you're in a new tribe. And everyone in Haleiwa is just saying, hey, Kanga, you're cool here. You know, so it's not like people all over Hawaii don't like me. Yeah. It's the hui that it's poisoned by Fast Eddie. Yeah. So I go there and I'm surfing and doing this stuff and we come into the contest and here we are, you know, right at the <clears throat> jersey. There's Squiddy standing there vibing me when I pick up my jersey. So I pick up my jersey, hey, g'day, mate. And so go out there and smash it, yeah. come back in, drop it in. Go, you know, next heat, he's there vibing and go out and kill it. 
then I'm in the final and I win this thing hands down. And I come in and I'm on the stage and he's in the front row on the stage and I got my trophy and I'm just going, see this? <laughs> you will never have this, no matter what you do. And that's, you know, these things become motivation. Yeah. Like, and, you know, you want to have... Um, so what are you getting back to the, the many trials, right? So this, this is the trial that you've been through. What did it do for you? I mean, what do you, you, know, you we tell, it's a funny story and it's a great story, but as far as like mental toughness, um, what, what yeah, do you think? You know, the, uh, I, Far City, you know, I, I land there and I, I call up a guy from, who was meant to be helping me and he goes, there's not, nothing I can do for you. There's a contract out on you. Like I land and I'm running yeah. the ASP. There's a contract out on me. Yeah. And I'm just going, oh. So, you know, I come out from surfing one day at Aokai, and this guy is standing there, and he's got the, you know, the uh, black gloves on and the fingers cut off, and he's standing there, and he, get, he goes, I've been trained to kill you. And I'm thinking, is this guy, you know, ex-Vietnam vet is, you know, can literally do this? <clears throat> and so we were sparring around, and... Um, Sitting there was Fast Eddie on a bench watching this contract beating go down. And Ben Iper and Dan Kaloha, who didn't have the balls to actually, they were, they were my peers, mm -hmm. yeah. didn't have the balls to you know, confront me. And I'm just looking at this going on and I'm you know, dodging this, you know, because um, the bad thing is I never learned how to fight really. Yeah. You know, the. The good thing is I never learned how to fight because, I mean, I would have killed this guy. So we, we spar, we get across the road, and all of a sudden I'm just going, this is bullshit. And I'm, about, and I'm about to grab this guy and throw him in front of a car. And I've just realized, like, I'm about to kill this guy yeah. over surfing. Like, what is wrong with you people? Yeah. Like, surfing is so beautiful and pure and the ability to challenge yourself against the ocean it's just so amazing you know what are you thinking you know why are you guys polluting you know Duke Hanamoko's legacy yeah it's like it just to me it's um you know so in 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 essence um, shortly after, you know, we, I was running the big events in California and we had the OP Pro rights and I flew back to Australia because, you know, I just, I couldn't imagine, like in Australia, you could have a huge event and people that have, you know, they'd have a couple of beers and find a chick. They wouldn't riot. <laughs> I mean, burn down police stations and lifeguard headquarters and set cop cars on fire. At a surf contest, what, what is wrong with you people? <laughs> like, there is something weird in America yeah. that, you know. Yeah, that, it's, it's probably good, yeah, good, good segue. So, you know, we, we talked about how you grew up surfing in, in, in pretty benign times, going into um, a little more violent aspect of the North Shore. That's still, that's still 40 years ago, 50 years ago. What do you think, how, what's the difference between the the local vibes today you see versus what you saw back then. I mean, there, some places it's probably a little bit better, but I think a lot of like you get you alluded to it here just now. There's a weird thing going on. It's a weird thing going yeah. on on the North Shore. Yeah, you know, Kalai Alexander started the Wolf Pack. Yeah, which on the heels of the Hui, um, and you know, I got threatened by him. Yeah, you know, because Sean Thompson made a movie which told the truth, and you know, so it was. I, I mean. So I, I go there and I'm coaching guys. So I, I drove down to Oceanside and I bought some pepper spray. Well, before that, I'd already gone yeah. to Big Five and bought a, a shotgun, yeah. which I had in the car. And I had a baseball bat in my, my surfboard bag. So I promised myself after that incident that if anyone tries any shit with me, I'm going to fight my way back to the car. I'm going to blow their head off. Yeah. Uh, and I'm the head of the ASP. <laughs> right. And a champion and a surfer. supposed to be fun, right? <clears throat> and yeah. this is my mental state, you know, going to Hawaii because I was not going to. Uh, every one of my peers apologized to them. 
And I just went, I'm, I've got nothing to apologize for. You're fucking gangsters. You should be in jail. You should be under a rock, nowhere near surfing. Like, yeah. And I will never change because it's wrong. And so, you know, so that happened. Um, and so we, we, we come and, you know, I'm, I'm uh, you know, getting threatened again by Kala because of the movie. You know, and we just, it's just weird. I was at the uh, a contest at Sunset and Kala comes up and I'd already met him. Like, he's a super nice guy. But it was this mask came over him where he, he changed into another person. Like, that was all lies. If you weren't so old, I'd kick your ass now. And all of these people at the contest had never seen him do his thing. They'd never seen the veneer get pulled off mm. and see who this guy really is. Yeah. So that's going down. And meanwhile, I'd, I'd gone down Oceanside to the Army and Navy store and I bought myself um, some pepper spray and stun gun. So, like, let me tell you, you got to be careful when you sit down with your pepper spray because you can set it off. <laughs> it sets fire, right? So people don't get there. So like I'm going to the beach in Hawaii with my stun gun and my pepper spray yeah. or my shotgun and my baseball bat. Yeah. Like that to me is, you know, you got some, got some cleaning up to do, guys. Yeah. Like why would a community allow that to happen in, in their community? Right. Um, you know, where are the people standing up? So this, this, you know, just went on. And it was, he's going off on me over there and someone is called Fast Eddie. And Fast Eddie comes down and, and, and he's coming in there. And it's like, I'm just, you know, you picture two dogs. Yeah. And one's got their kind of back to it, but they're looking out the corner of their eye and he's walking by. And, and I'm just going, dude, why am I back in this movie, you know? <laughs> and then he turns around. And it goes, that movie was all lies. You need to tell Sean Thompson. Like, I always respected you, but you need to. I'm just going, he's switching personalities as he's ranting at me, you know what I'm saying? And I just went, like, you're seriously troubled, mate. <laughs> like, it's, this is like a day at the surf contest at Huntington Beach for Kanga. Yeah. Right? What, and, what year was that? It was a. Oh, that was, I was coaching, guys. It was yeah. 90s. 90s, yeah. And, but that was, so I fly back to Western Australia after the OP program. Right, 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 yep. And the phone rings, and it's, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm the um, district attorney at Honolulu. I go, yeah, oh, that's interesting. And he goes, um, we've got Fast Eddie in custody, and I was wondering if you want to testify. I thought, ooh, okay. And so I, you know, it's Friday. I, I go, I check my passport. My passport has expired. My US visa is expired. I call the guy back and he goes, okay, let me fix it. Saturday, I'm in the, you know, the Australian office. So I'm getting a new passport. Sunday, I'm in the US consulate getting a new visa. Wow. Yeah. Monday, I'm on the plane and I land in Honolulu and they go, well, you know, paging Mr. Cairns, you'll be first off the plane and this custom guy's come and he's got the gun on the whole thing. <laughs> yep. And so I get escorted off the, off the plane through customs out to, and I get handed over to a detective from the HPD, and the guy goes, like Dirty Harry, right? <laughs> I pity anyone that comes near you. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> and I'm just going, okay. Uh. <laughs> so I'm going, all right, because these guys are, you know, he's in jail for, you know, cocaine and all, yeah. and, you know, it's rumored that he's killed people and all, all sorts of stuff. And it was just, but, my civic duty is to tell the truth. And so I'm up there and it's a bail reduction hearing and I just lay out my, you know, this year, this year, this year, this year, this is what this guy and this guy have done to me. And, you know, he stayed in jail for another year and a half because he couldn't reduce bail. He was on $3 million bail. Wow, yeah. You know, that, that's <clears throat> back in like 80, 86 or something. Yeah. yeah. So, like, the, they knew he was a bad guy, but then somehow uh, they messed up the search and he got out. But now I've testified against the gangster, right? Yeah. So when I come back to run a contest, you know, suddenly 
uh, I'm running the Bud Surf Tour. I come back in 91, I'm running the Bud Surf Tour, and we're going, we're going to run a contest at Isla Moana. And so the phone rings, and he goes, hey, bro, look, I had an unlisted number, right? Someone gave him my number. Hey, bro, what for you testify? I, I, um, Eddie, mate, I just told the truth. You know, the kind of shit you pushed on me for yeah. 20 years. I live with it. He said, bro, don't come Hawaii. And I thought, oh, and everyone's telling me, don't go. <laughs> yeah. and so I go to, <laughs> we're running the contest. We go to um, Ala Moana, and one night, one evening, me and Alyssa are packing up, and I've got my security guy. I come down, which is uh, David Nueva's father. You know, it's a champion. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, great guy. And there's Fast Eddie, and I'm at Ala Moana Park. And I go, all right, Hawaiian, I, you know, you, you know your rides. So me and Alyssa jump in the back of the truck. And Eddie goes, hey, Hawaiian, I like ride too. So I'm, now he's in the front of the truck. Me and Alyssa are in the back of the pickup truck. And I'm going to Alyssa. This is pretty bad. Yeah. Like, it, you know, we're on, you know, you, you're going to, you, as soon as we stop, you got to run. Like, we're on the way to the cane fields. And uh, so we, you know, we get there. Um, to where we were in the parking lot, to, and he stops, and Eddie gets out, and he goes, hey, bro, you know, all that stuff you did was bad, but there's a development on the North Shore that's going to pollute all the North Shore, and it's bigger than all of us, so we need to team together. <laughs> and, you know, so if you can, at your contest, if you can do petitions and stuff, that, you know, we can work together to stop this. And I go, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> okay. So he goes, give me that hat. And he takes my Bud Tour hat and he gives me a hooey hat. And he just goes, all right, we'll do this. And, you know, this is, you know, we're not friends, but this is bigger than both of us. So now we're, because the heat was so on him, like he couldn't do anything. Yeah. And this is probably worked out by Mr. Nueva and the behind the scenes and stuff. Right, right, right. Um, so, we, you know, we, we go there and the next morning we, we pull up. I got my hooey hat on and yeah. we're walking down this long pathway and there's this mob of hooey guys there. And I'm walking up there with Alyssa and they go, hey, bro, does Eddie know you got that hooey hat? <laughs> oh, yeah, mate, I got it off him last night. How you doing, mate? And kept on walking and all of a sudden you hear him talking like, oh, my God, there's new rules. <laughs> like, you can't hassle Kanga anymore. It's just sort of like bizarre, yeah, really bizarre. So we ran the contest, and it it just went on. And you know, number of times when we we're doing the movie, Eddie was in it, and I just you know went up to shake hands with him, just go, you, you know what? Yeah, let's just let bygones be bygones. And you are you, I am me. Yeah. No one's going to change. But we just go. Why why can't we just have a drink and have a laugh? There you are. Let's just, let's get over it. Get over it. And I'm thinking, whoa. And then it was just a couple of years ago, he was at Huntington. And I was walking down, you know, side street. And there he's sitting there with his mates and stuff. And again, I went over to him and just said, let's just shake hands and let bygones be bygones. Oh, no. And as I'm walking away, there, he and his son are laughing. And I'm thinking, do I go back and sort this shit out? And I went, no, no, just... Let them stew yeah. in their own horrible juices. You know, carrying this kind of anger and angst and dislike, you know, it's a weight on your shoulders. Yeah, it poisons your soul. Just yeah. let it go. Yeah. Be free. Have, just go, yeah, that was heavy. Man. Remember when you test, oh, that was awesome. Oh, I can't believe you said that. I mean, imagine how much fun you could have <laughs> over a few beers just fucking ribbing each other. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 that was one of the, we were you know, we went down to uh, Perth back in the day, and we'd, we actually broke down in, in, um, in uh, 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 Darwin, <laughs> right? And so the first experience of Darwin coming out of the hotel was two locals in this huge fist fight compiling out of the bar. Yeah, and they're they're you know going at each other for we're like just watching them, and all of a sudden they get up and they laugh each other off and they pit each other on the back and go back in and they buy each other beers, <laughs> and I was just like, wow, you know, <laughs> but that that's culturally like our culture. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we have a disagreement. Yeah, you take care of it, and then we're, we're thirsty. You move on. <laughs> yeah, the beer's cold. Let's go. Let's have something. Yeah, it's just, yeah. 
It, to me, it's just sort of like weird. So, I mean, to me, it's just a, like I just have a lot of stories. Yeah. And, you know, I don't carry, I don't carry any anger yeah. or animosity. In fact, I'm, I'm thankful for having had these challenges in my life. Right. right. You know, because I know that uh, I will step up, which we in our society are meant to step up and defend our ideals. Keep that, keep in mind that, because we're going to get into a little bit more of the, of the controversial stuff here in a second, but to close out kind of the surfing aspect of it, um, where do you see surfing going next 10, 15 years, 20 years? What do you, what do you think is going to be the next thing? I know you, you're, you're heavily involved in wave parks and things like that. I mean, yeah, I've been involved in, in wave parks. Um, I've been in, involved, I've coached the USA team and you know, yeah. won three world titles. Yeah. It's coach of the USA team, yeah. um, which was sort of like full circle from being a member of the Australian teams at those events. And I always pushed the idea that of what a great personal experience it was for anyone to represent their country. And when we won the Stand Up Paddle World Championship with Sean, he won the, yep. the surfing yep. and we, won, we defeated Australia and we'd lost like three times to Australia. And those guys were always putting heat on me. Like you turn coat, and I'm just, <laughs> man, I happen to be an Australian who lives in America and the opportunity to coach. And I have asked the guys at Surfing Australia if you wanted me to coach, and they turned me down. Yeah. So I'm here, and I'm sure as hell going to try and beat you. And actually, I beat Australia three times, <laughs> which was very satisfying. I was going to say, yeah, it tastes quite nice. Very I satis- And yeah. right now, they're starting um, the World Games yeah. in um, El Salvador which is one of the qualifications for the Olympics. So to have surfing into the Olympics and have something that's really this alternative sport um, uh, represented at the highest level of international sport mm-hmm. is fairly exceptional. But it, but it, but it also, um, I got one foot in the organized camp and then I have my other foot in the camp of surfing as individuals yeah. and living with the ocean. So I refuse to uh, talk of surfers as an athlete. I mean, of course, we're extraordinarily athletic, yeah. but we're not an athlete. We are this bohemian bunch of misfits <laughs> that live this you know, blessed life in this amazing arena in touch with nature. Yeah. And completely at the whim of the ocean. And this makes us really, really different. And the moment that we lose that identity, we lose our identity as surfers. And so where is surfing going? WSL is constantly talking about surfers as athletes. And they are so connected to the woke culture. And they're so out of touch with the world of surfing. And it's blowing up right now, you know, because you bring a, a suit from Hollywood to run the place and he's doing all of this great stuff, you've got the judging panel. Yeah. Like yeah. if you can't get the judging panel right, you're going to get hit on social media and it's <laughs> going to affect your and impact your relationship with sponsors. Right. Because they don't want to be involved with anything controversial. Yeah, it'll kill your brand for sure. Yeah. yeah. And this is going on. I know that I was kept up last night. With the head of sales at WSL, what do I need to do? And I should read you the thing. Like, <laughs> you don't let a f- suit from Hollywood um, talk down to surfers. Like, we're done with that. <laughs> They've hired three suits to run the WSL. And the world of surfing is just going, no, we're done with you, fools. Yeah. Have those guys even surfed before? Anyone? Well, no, this yeah. guy's a stand up paddle guy. Oh, okay. No, right. well, it's even worse. <laughs> like, it's a suit from Hollywood that worked for Oprah that's a stand up paddler uh-huh. and it's trying to be bros. And they just had a, just posted a, um, an open letter. Yeah. To yeah. surfing. Like, yeah, you know, from a high. Right. Yeah, from Mount Olympus comes yeah, the, the missive. Word. Yeah, the, 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 the word from God, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, 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 on the tablets. Yeah. It's coming down to Moses to those peons out in the surf world. You need to do what I, Eric Logan, say. And all of us, us, we're just going, you know what? 
time for you to vacate the chair, mate. <laughs> and that's happening yeah. right now. And so now you've got billionaires owning surfing and the, um, the peons are voting no. Yeah. It, in, in our world of surfing, it's mirroring the general world. Like we peons are happy to do what we're doing, leave us alone. Yeah, I think the, the, the term was, you know, making you care. If you make me care, it's, it's like any, any time you try to tell somebody something, it's not going to go over well, I don't think. No, but, but particularly a group of really independent people that have made a lifestyle choice to... Oh, independence. <laughs> independence and go surfing, yeah. and we're more than happy to be 100 miles from anyone by ourselves yeah. out getting a few waves with some sharks. Like, we, we are that kind of you know, crazy person. Mm -hmm. And so um, we were able to put some structure into things. So this is the um, diametrically opposed parts of my personality, which is really organized and really um, explosively carefree and independent. Like, though, how do those two things live inside one person? Yeah. It's, it's been... Uh, my question, which I haven't answered yet. Well, I think it gets into, um, you know, that, one of the sections I have in here talking about how you cleanse your soul. And obviously both of us are, are you know, have a huge affinity for the ocean. For me, that's definitely where I, you know, both metaphorically and physically, if I get in, get in the water, even if it's a bad day, it's still going to be a great day because I got in the water, right? Well, well, and you, so you I, just... think that's, I think that's where, and, and like you, you know, my, my military side is very much... I, I, you know, we have a plan, we're going to execute the plan, we're going to debrief, we're going to get lesson learned, we're going to go do it better next time. But there is something about having to have that, that, I don't know, free space, free time that allows you to reconnect with yourself. And uh, what do you what do you think about that? What do you, what do you do? What does Ian do to well, kind of cleanse your soul? How does, how do you think that? So how do we reconnect with the universe? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm, and, yeah. and so we're in this closed world and we're dealing with all this sort of stuff and all of a sudden you can be free and let the universe come to you. Yeah. And so this is when you're, when you're in the ocean. I mean, you just look at the science of the ions, um, in, you know, the ionized water. Yeah. You look at the earthing, that's the electrons coming into your feet at the beach. Right. The you, wave energy. The yeah. wave energy. Yeah. All of yeah. these things together are the, the kind of engine of life. And then water is an essential element of, of life, and yet we, it, it seems like to me, this is where the higher power lives. Yeah. And, you know, because I'm, I'm not religious, but, um, you know, I have prayed yeah. to survive. <laughs> right. And, <laughs> you know, please, please, Lord, <laughs> you know, let me come up. Please, Lord, let my boys succeed. Yeah. You know, these things. But I'm, I'm not really, you know, religious. The, I mean, I did. Sunday school at Presbyterian <clears throat> Church, right? You know, the, which is like the sum total of my religious background. Yeah. And I got two really, really good books there. Yeah. You know, yeah. really good books, which I have as my, my favorite ones, like um, hunting, you know, cannibals in New Guinea. And the other one is the English captain who went out and shot the man-eating tigers in India. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, man-eaters of command. Yep. Like mind-boggling, you know, courageous stories, you know, man again in nature, and you know, dealing with the complexity of nature, and you know, the these things. This is the essence of um, how we get freedom. Yeah, for me. So yeah, I can just saddle up and cruise down and catch a few waves. Um, <laughs> it's just really bizarre. People go, "Whoa, you're really good at that." <laughs> <laughs> I'm going. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I think you know one of the one of the things I I really liked about you, and I got getting to know you as far as a from a surfing standpoint, not just a personal standpoint. But you know, I tell the story a lot, and we talked about it last night. We were laughing about it, and went on our second SUP vets, and this is what Ian, this is how Ian is, and how he how I look at him as a coach. Um, he's very intense, and so if you're not used to intensity. Um, he can kind of scare you. And so we're sitting there on the beach, we, and we're getting out there, and, and it's really big down there in Mexico. 
and at the time I was what 54 I think 55 and and I'd had come off two knee surgeries and I had you know not only Ian but you know Sean Pointer and uh, and Daniel Hughes so you got two world champions and a Pan Am game champion or gold bronze medalist and so three professional surfers are going wow this is the biggest we've ever seen down here and so I'm sitting here looking I'm looking here in the three professional surfers talking about how big it was and I'm going dude I don't know and Ian looked at me and he looked at me and he go challenge yourself Nate <laughs> you know and just with a little bit of dripping disdain in his lips like you what do you want some old man you know and uh, but that what really then it hit me is like yeah you know, this is how you get better. And, and, uh, and so we did, we went and pedaled out and got the best whip of my life to that point, got it on film even. And so I had one of the best experiences I'll never forget. And so for me, that was always like a, a codifying experience of just how, um, when you do push those limits and you get past them, then your vision just keeps opening up. Then the next level is possible. Yes. And, and that, to me, that's how you only way to get better is to get to that limit and, or, or perceived limit. It's not a limit. It's no. a perceived limit. It's your own self-limitation. Yeah. And so that whole push you gave to me was hugely confidence building with respect just to not only surfing, but kind of life in general. Isn't it yeah. amazing that these uh, in, you know, situations in surfing can become metaphors for life? They are, totally. They, they're, they're completely applicable. Yeah. And, and really what I was telling you there was my vision, even though we're on the beach and there's a shore break and it's flat and it's waves yep. breaking, yep. it's all condensed. In fact, I was watching it from plan view, from the top. And I was able to see the pattern and the pathway. And so it was broken into multiple components. Yeah. Like get past the shore break, the, the waves will, will back off. So now you've got a quiet path. You now have to get past, and the set comes and it closes out. Well, it's, it's limited to a number of waves. So you deal with those waves, and then it's open, and you're out. And then when you're out, you ride waves, and you, you, know, you, you get in the loop. So you see how everything is, is a pattern, and it can be broken into components that individually become simple to overcome. Yep. And so when you, when you, you know, when, when we go to the WSL, for instance, he's got an overwhelming problem because they're going to run a contest in Brazil. There are death threats coming for the judges already in Brazil. <laughs> oh, wow. Which are real. Yeah, they're real. They're not just... Yeah, yeah so yeah. this is going on. And so, therefore, it's this massive problem for them, and it's going to impact their sponsorships and their, all of this sort of stuff. When... How about we just take the, the massive pile of problems yeah. and just, you know, sift them <laughs> apart and prioritize them and choose the one that's most important to deal with, right? Let's just deal with that right now. Yeah. And then we'll do, deal with the next one and we'll deal with the next one. Before you know it, there's not a problem. I mean, I could literally fix this in a couple of days. <laughs> But you have to want to fix it, and you have to actually get outside your, outside your box. And I, they, and they have to want me to fix it right. because they know that if they engage with a mad dog, <laughs> like, it's going to happen. Yeah. And the majority of people don't want it. But, you know, we, these are billionaires. And, you know, they're gonna, they, if, if they choose to, you know, I'm already engaged with the head of sales who knows they got a storm and she's getting feedback already. Yeah. Um, and she has direct connection to the owner. And if I get in the owner, it'll be black and white to him. You know, this ha needs to happen, this needs to happen, and this needs to happen. It needs to happen today. Or disengage with me. And good luck. Because you, none of you fools, understand us. And I, I, I sent a, you know, there's, it's Italo and Gabriel, former world, you know, yeah, former world champions, extraordinary people. Italo won the last Olympics. Mm -hmm. um, they feel they got ripped off. You know, they've got massive social media, you know, 15 million Instagram right, followers, right, 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 right. right. Huge power. <clears throat> and I, I just said um, to Sherry, Elo is temporary. Gabriel and Italo are forever. So who gets the chop? You step, say, 
Thank you, Elo. See ya. What can we do, Elo and Gabriel? How can we become part of the family again? Yeah. It's no more complex than that. But they're going to, you know, make it this massive scene. And, you know, it, it, it's just sort of like... Well, they forgot the customer base, like you said, right? Yeah, these guys have the power and influence to seriously screw up, you know, your Latin American ordering. Seri I mean, talking national, international incident, yeah. kind of. Right. And, you know, how do you, how do you stop that? I mean, to me, you it's got, easy. You gotta fail first, I think. Yeah. Well, no, the, what, they, what they need to do is they need, we don't need to be preached to by, you know, some incompetent. Yeah. Um, we need surface to solve the problem amongst surface which they don't understand. We're rich and we do all this sort of stuff. We get whatever we want. <laughs> <laughs> until pe until the, pe the peons go, ah, uh, no. It really is reflective of what's going on society-wide, I would think. Sounds yeah. like, you know, whether it be, you know, the Bud Light kerfuffle or any of those type of the Target, right? Going on Target, like you know, North Face. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, these, they don't understand that the, the drinkers of Budweiser and Bud Light are never coming back. Yeah. There's other beers. Yeah, a lot and of other really good we beers. Felt, <laughs> we felt that you represented our, um, our standards and our ethics, and you violated trust with me. I'm done. Goodbye. And I don't need to get upset. You, know, you cheated on me. See ya. And this is going to happen over and over again. And, you know, and what happens? Opportunity arrives. Someone else comes along and goes, you know, I like you guys. My beer's good. And you go, ooh, it is good. I like it. All right, cool. All right, so um, we're, just for the audience's uh, context, we've been, we're filming this right after Memorial Day weekend. And, you know, obviously all of us at uh, Cavu International, being, most of us being military veterans, uh, had a, you know, we have some somber, uh, experiences and uh, it was a it was a great way to remember some of my fallen comrades this weekend. Um, for me personally, I always do the Murph challenge uh, in honor of uh, Michael Murphy, and uh, and so we had one of our uh, other my other colleagues here, uh, Will Bernie. He did the Murph challenge as well. A lot of us do that across the globe um, as just a way of just honoring those who have given their all. Uh, for you, Ian, you, you know, what we uh, do with SCP Vets, we have a group text. Um, each of the retreats that we have so we keep that connection going because once you join a tribe that's what gets you through the tough parts in life and every one of us at least in my opinion every one of us at some point if we do if we always stay if we always try and do something by ourselves at some point you're going to meet somebody or something tougher than you and you're going to lose and so you need that tribe to get you through those tough times and, uh, and Ian, you'd mentioned, you know, one of the uh, e uh, texts we got, it was uh, uh, a shot of Sean Ryan on his show um, talking about Memorial Day. And you wanted to make some comments on that. So I'd like to love to hear your, your thoughts on what, what Sean had to say. Yeah, when, when you look at the, you know, our background in, in Australia with uh, my grandfather was in the trenches in World War I, mm -hmm. you know, lost an eye. Um, my, he, was, he also was in the army again in, in Egypt in the Second World War. My dad. Um, was in New Guinea, um, so you know, I've read a lot about all all of this stuff, and you know I was in the last conscription in 1972. My number didn't come up, mm. and this was so we you know conscripts were going to Vietnam, right? And and so, but I was so single mindedly focused on uh, you know surfing and succeeding at that <clears throat> that um, I. I didn't realize that I would have those challenges in life <laughs> that were sort of in, in, a, in a way, um, you know, coming of age as a man. Yeah. And so, uh, but uh, always completely respected the, the, the role of the, the military in terms of protecting us and the police in terms of protecting our security at, at, in our towns. So when, when Sean Ryan was, was talking, I just went, wow, this, you know, because I'm going to be hanging with Wes, and how, you know, can I respect what I know his experiences are? And he, he just said that um, we're, we're happy to do what we do because we would do it over again yeah. because that's who we are. Yeah. 
But what we want to know, we want all of you to look in the mirror and ask yourself the question, am I worth dying for? Which uh, for, for me was really profound. Like this is, when you're alone with your thoughts, you know, looking in the mirror, yeah. am I the man I want to be? Am I the, the kind of friend, uh, family member? Am I the kind of father that um, stands for ethics and responsibility and goals and orientation, all these things? It was really a profound, it was impactful for me. And, you know, so um, I realized that, you know, I'm raising 21 year old boys and I'm mentoring mm -hmm. my sons, which is our greatest. Um, it's the, the hardest job we'll ever do. It's the riskiest. It's all of these, these things. Um, I'm helping my wife go through losing her father and a mother, you know, going downhill with, you know, dementia. And yeah. um, how, so, uh, and I realize that the more energy I give to them, the uh, better I feel. You know, so I, uh, you know, I'm just turned 70 or I'm about to turn 71. You know, what is my mission? You know, th this is my mission. How can, you know, I got woken up by Ethan talking about last night and, uh, and talking about being interviewed at Tesla. And I talked, you know, I surfed with Malachi and he's, you know, working on Navy ships. And both of these guys have um, promising futures uh, largely because we made a really solid home for them. And, um, you know, Dad was a fairly harsh disciplinarian as a young, young man, but they were taught to be polite and friendly and accepting of others and to work hard and to have goals and challenges above what they, what they you know, they think they have now, always reach above. And so how, you know, how can I help them become an example uh, to the world of who Ian Cairns is. That's, and so when I, when I look in the mirror, you know, those are the thoughts that come through in my mind. So what is our job as a civilian? Is to make sure that we have great kids, we have great communities, we create prosperity, we create positive attitude, and together when, when you have... Um, one family next to another family into a community, into a state, you have America. That's, that's the America that I immigrated to, and that's the America that we create inside my home. And so all of this other crazy shit that's going on in the moment in politics and economically and stuff like that, to me, is, is a negative anomaly, which it's the pendulum. Yeah. swinging to one side and if we hang tough it will swing back and you know our values will become recognized yeah i think you know it always goes back and forth right so you had you had swing the, the pendulum swinging back and forth and the had the progressive era in the 1920s and you it swung back and you had it swing back in the 60s people forget about how violent the country was you know back in the 60s yep yeah. and uh and so yeah i think that i think you're absolutely right so with that, with that thought in mind, um, looking, what would 70-year-old Ian tell 20-year-old Ian at this point in his life? What would be the three best lesson learned, three biggest scars you can, you can uh, tell 20-year-old Ian, uh, here's what, you know, what I've learned in over 70 years of life? Well, you know what? I, uh, I almost quit my surfing thing, and Pat told me to go there yeah. and don't quit. There's, you know, there's, there's only pain when you quit. Like, <laughs> and there's regret. Yeah. Like, I don't have any regrets. Um, we had a massive riot at the OP Pro. And I, and I, I, I realized that, you know, effectively, again, I looked in the mirror and I realized we'd over-promoted and we'd, we'd attracted a crowd of people that mm. weren't pure surfers. Yeah. And therefore, it was my fault. So I went back to Australia, and with uh, you know we had two young kids, um, you know my oldest Amy and Johnny, 
And so I was able to be there with my, you know, my parents and their grandkids uh, when my father died. So in, in a sense, it was ordained uh, to me by fate that that would happen and I'd make that course correction. And then I came back here and I came back to find that uh, people, uh, you know, communities sort of, you know, swell. And I was a leader in the community because I was running the ASP and these, these events in the surf mm -hmm. community. And I, I walked away from that. And when I came back in 91, the community had closed against me. And I realized, whoa. Like, um, and I had people that had been friends were talking about me behind my back. And I realized, hmm, I will overcome. So from 91, 97, I took ownership of the ASP North America, the Bud Surf Tour, mm -hmm. the US Open of Surfing. It, it took me six years of hard work and commitment you know, with Alyssa, my you know, surfer wife, uh, to go through those times and take my rightful place as the leader of the surf community in, in the competitive world. And uh, those, those things, you know, they, they always come from um, disaster. And how do you deal with it? Do you lay down like a dog and quit? No, you get back up. And so what do I do here? You know, I'm 70. We've just closed a business. It didn't work well. And then the phone rang, and a friend of mine has all of these patents, and he goes, Ian, I want you to come and work with me. And he's like the genius uh, innovator, <laughs> and I'm the operator. Yeah. I have these things. Like, I operate. I know how to organize. And he, I go, no, Nick, stop. This is what we need. And so I now have this incredibly challenging and overwhelming. I'm learning about, you know, solar energy and, yep. um, you know, Electric automobiles and yeah. you know, the coffee business, and we have an H, <laughs> you know, H ninety N ninety five mask, and we have all of this sort of like really. So it's incredibly stimulating, and I'm learning a huge amount of things, and I'm struggling to find time to go surfing, and I know that physically I have to go surfing, or else my body will seize. Yeah. And so how do I how do I find the balance in all of this thing? And my boys are doing this. So my life is incredibly full with these in, um, incredible ideas, meeting you know, hugely interesting people. And you know, so it's, it's just sort of like spectacular how when you say yes, how powerful that word is. Yes, I'd like to talk to you about that. Wow, isn't that interesting? Let's make it happen. And that's, so you see the, optimism and positive attitude that you can bring to things and yeah like i got creaky old bones and it hurts to get up but when i ride a wave i'm like 20 again because my feet haven't forgotten how to dance <laughs> love it all right. Well, I'll tell you what, Ian, it's been a true pleasure having you on. It's been amazing getting to know you and got to get back down to Mexico before we, oh, totally. before uh, time gets away from us. Oh, totally. Yeah. So thank you. And, uh, pleasure having you. Oh, love you, brother.